Fuck. I, I knew we would. I, when I read through it, I could see. All right, it is 7.03 and we're going to call to order the regular Housing and Redevelopment Authority meeting. It is August 21st, please note the attendance. And the first item is approval of the minutes of two different meetings. One is the regular HRA meeting of July 17th, 2017. And the second was a special HRA meeting of August 3rd, 2017. So move. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Are there any questions or discussion? All right, hearing none, all in favor of approving the minutes of both meetings, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, we've approved both meetings. Next, we have approval of this evening's agenda. Move approval. Second. Se all right, it's been moved and seconded. Are there, is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the agenda, please say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, we've approved the agenda. Next, we have our consent calendar, Mr. Devich. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the HRA. I'm trying to find the consent calendar on this. And, oh, wait a minute, I'll just go to the next computer and then I'll find it. All right, uh, for those in the audience, both here and at home, the consent calendar contains usually separate, several separate items, tonight only one, which are acted upon by the HRA in one motion. Once a con consent calendar has been approved, the individual item and its recommended action will also have been approved and no further uh, actions necessary. So item A is consideration of the approval of resolution, consenting to the inclusion by Inland Development Partners, Chamberlain LLC, of certain property with respect to land use approvals, and that concludes tonight's consent calendar. I'll move the consent calendar. Second. 
Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is, are there any questions or is there any discussion? All right, hearing none, all in favor of approving the consent calendar, please say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, we've approved the consent calendar. Okay, that brings us to consideration of the approval of a resolution authorizing the purchase of real property at 6409 16th Avenue. Mr. Devich. Uh, thank you, Chair Supple, members of the HRA. Uh, this item, which involves the uh, purchase of real property at 6409 16th, I'm gonna turn that over to Julie Irvin, our housing manager. Well, and thank you. Chair Supple, commissioners. Um, so the owner of 6409 16th Avenue has approached the HRA about purchasing his property. This property is located in the Cedar Point 2 redevelopment area. And as you know, the HRA recently cut ties with the developer, Boy Claire, who was working to redevelop this area. And since that time, we've um, told the homeow uh, homeowners that we may be able to purchase homes if people are interested in selling while we aren't able to purchase all, uh, we could um, consider um, if some were interested, and we were approached by uh, Mr. Schertner for his property. So we had the property appraised, and it appraised at $198,000, and so we made an offer to the homeowner for that amount. He has made a counter offer to the HRA of $205,000. Uh, a letter from Mr. Schertner is included in your packet that explains his reasons for that. He is also here tonight and can speak to that. And I will just say that this property is one of the remaining 12 single family homes that will need to be acquired for uh, redevelopment of this area. Um, funding is available for the purchase through the HRA's development fund. Um, just a little bit of context that we have in the past purchased some homes in this area back in 2015, one was on the market. And so we were able to purchase that, that is at 6333 16th. We, um, it was listed at 189, we had it appraised for 179 and then we were able to offer in the middle at 184, 300 and we're able to acquire it for that amount. Uh, we also were able to purchase 6401 16th Avenue, a homeowner who was moving out of state and we had had it appraised at one point for 185 and then nothing happened and so a year later we had it reappraised and it appraised lower at 180 but we were able to pay him the 185 we determined that we could do that. Um, so as you know, this area is part of the Cedar Corridor Master Plan, which calls for high density residential, and we have been working actively to redevelop the area, but are in limbo at this point, um, looking for a new developer. Um, Mr. Schertner will explain that he's just ready to move on and was interested in hearing what we would be able to offer. So he has not listed his home, but is interested in selling and would like to close by October 31st. Um, in this case, just um, so you know, the purchase is voluntary, so there wouldn't be any relocation assistance available. Mr. Stark? Yep, Madam Chair, I would just add, you know, um, there were, somebody had asked me, you know, what our process is for valuing um, properties that we purchased. And I did double check this with HRA attorney Julie Eddington. And really, it's, we have to have a rationale. Uh, and it has to be a consistent rationale and a defensible rationale. In the past, the the most simple, the most defensible has been an appraisal. Um, <coughs> oftentimes, a uh, homeowner can get their own appraisal that might differ a little bit. And sometimes an appraisal is more of an art than a science. Um, but there are other rationale uh, over and above an appraisal that um, the HRA can consider. Um, in this case, uh, having reviewed the appraisal, um, Ms. Urban and myself, we did note so in an appraisal, there are comparable, um, that's how you get to evaluation. You find comparable sales in the area, uh, and they give a, a number of adjustments to those sales. In all cases, uh, the comparables, I believe all three were in Ridgefield. Um, in all three cases, um, the uh, appraised value for this particular property was um, impacted negatively to the neighborhood of uh, 9,500 uh, to 11,000 because of its um, the uh, neighborhood uh, and the other three comparables were not that far away uh, and so by the neighborhood uh, I think um, my interpretation is that because it's got a lot of vacant properties behind it uh, and because it's got um, other uh, redevelopment activity 
so I guess I would say that to the extent that the um, negative impact on valuation caused by the neighborhood that's in essence been caused by actions taken by the HRA, uh, that that would be a rationale for um, uh, for giving uh, additional funding if that were your um, if that's where you want to go with this. Right. Without objection, if Mr. Schertner would like to say a few words, you're welcome to. If you could go up to the microphone and state your name and address. Letter. Um, I think the market supports the, the number. Um, I had thought maybe a, between a two and a 210 would have been a fair price for the, for the property. It's kind of a meet me in the middle type situation like we've been talking about. Um, I've been there for 14 years coming up in November. I bought the house in November of 2003 and went to the Ridgefield Remodeling Fair the following February and I actually met with Mr. Stark there and I saw this map and I saw these houses in pink and I said, what are the ones in pink? And he goes, well, those are in the redevelopment area. And I was like, well, we've been here four months. <laughs> and my kids were nine and 11 at the time and I just decided, well, we're just gonna stay and make this our home. And now we're, I'm becoming pretty much you know, an empty nester. I've got a view, great view of Target's parking lot from my deck. <laughs> you know, and it, I feel it has been impacted by the commercial and the traffic and funny story, somebody messed up the gas line when they did the install two years ago. They left us on our, my side connected to the old main. They cut through it tonight. Yeah. We have no gas right now. Yeah. And so it's kind of like, that was kind of even the sprinkles on top of the cherry right now, <laughs> you know, for my situation. So I understand a municipal budget. Y'all don't have a blank check to write. I fully understand that. That's what I've been communicating. But I just feel that 205 is a very fair price for the property. All right. Thank you so much. Could you state your name again for uh, the record? Dan Schertner. Okay. That's all I have. Now, do we have any comments from any of the commissioners or questions? Commissioner Sandell? Just a question. Did you, by any chance, do your own appraisal? No, I did not. Okay. I, I didn't see the point. I mean, I did some research online on what houses were going for similarly in Richfield and stuff like that. And, you know, this is going to be enough for us to, or for me, basically, because I'm pretty trying to get the last kid out of the house, um, to just move on. You know, and you guys want the property. You have plans for the area. And I see this as kind of a win-win. You don't, there, I'm just another resident that you're not going to have to have a developer, for lack of a better term, deal. All right, Commissioner Howard, you had um, your uh, hand up. I guess this is uh, my first t time dealing with one of these situations on the HRA, but just kind of listening to our, our process and the circumstances specific to this and how you know the history of the HRA has had an impact uh, on the value uh, when you look at the whole project, kind of meeting in the middle seems reasonable, uh, seems like a reasonable option to me. Commissioner Rubenstein. It seems to me we do not have any uh, policy that uh, precludes us from uh, doing, uh, uh, going into his, paying more than our initial offer. Uh, it's within a very small percentage of the total cost of the, of the total value of the property. I am correct, there is no policy that precludes us from no, as long as we have, like I said, as long as there's some rationale. Okay. All right. I would be fine with going with the 205000 as well. I don't know if there are other thoughts. Um, Madam Chair, I just wanted to bring it to your attention that a, uh, a resident did send in an email about this topic, and I distributed that around mm -hmm. um, just so you're aware of it, and I have it on the record. Mm -hmm. I believe each, each of the commissioners has one copy. Yeah, well stated. Uh, does there need to be a motion to amend what's in the report or if you make the motion with a different amount in there you'd be making the motion so there's nothing to okay. amend okay the alternative recommendation would okay. be what you would okay. read madam chair I would like to uh, move that uh, the HRA approve the uh, sale of, uh, what is this address here? Uh, 6409 16th Avenue for the amount of 205,000, is that correct, 205,000? Mm -hmm. 205,000 dollars. 
So just to clarify, you're authorizing the purchase of that property? Uh, that is correct. At $205,000. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Um, just a comment. Commissioner Sandow. Um, I think it's fine, and I think by saving relocation benefits in the long run, we come out ahead. Um, the, the one thing I do want to point out is that this may set a precedent because the next one along the line will say, well, you did it for him, why won't you do it for me? But I think it's a rationale, and I, and I think the comments about the fact that the, um, the, the location of the property is less desirable given what we've already done to the neighborhood, I'm comfortable with supporting the motion. Yeah, and I would just add that these are really a case-by-case -case basis, mm -hmm. and we reviewed the appraisal for this particular property, and on this particular property, it had those um, modifications for the neighborhood value. That may not be the case on the next one. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one more question, Mr. Go ahead. Madam Chair? Um, how, many, how many houses are there left in order for the developer, a future developer? So there are 12 single-family homes remaining. This will be 11. This okay. will make 11. This is just the first yep. of 12. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any other comments, questions, considerations? All right, all in favor of the motion to approve the resolution authorizing the purchase of real property at 6409 16th Avenue for $205,000, please say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, we've approved the alternative recommendation. And good luck with getting number the last one out. <laughs> <laughs> Having been there and done that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you for coming in. All right, our next item is consideration of approval of a resolution approving a loan to the Aon Seasons Park LLC in the amount of $150,000 to assist with the purchase of the Seasons Park apartment complex. Mr. Devich. Again, thank you, Chair Supple, members of the HRA. Um, this item is, um, uh, again, the first um, step in the, uh, a, a proposal here to have the Housing Redevelopment Authority assist uh, Aon with um, the um, purchase of the Seasons Park um, apartment complex. In the audience, we have uh, Blake Hopkins, uh, from Aon who can answer any questions that uh, might come up. And I'm gonna turn this right over to John Stark to make the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Chair Supple and Commissioners. On April 25th, the HRA and City Council met with Aon representatives to discuss the potential purchase of the 422 unit Seasons Park apartment complex. Aon's goal would be to both preserve the naturally occurring affordable housing that's, that exists there and to rehabilitate units and common areas to ensure that the complex meets the community's desire for quality affordable housing. Following those discussions, Aon entered into a purchase agreement for the property. Aon has concluded that they could likely acquire the property with their current financial capacity, but that rehabilitation will require additional outside funding. As discussed in HRA memo number 23 dated August 10th, Aon has requested that the city, uh, HRA and or EDA provide 150,000 in upfront financing and 175,000 in both 2018 and 2019 for recurring rehabilitation costs. After review of the HRA and EDA budgets for 2017 and 2018, staff is recommending that the HRA approve a $100,000, I'm sorry, $150,000 no interest loan to Aon at the time of their purchase, which is uh, currently scheduled for September 7th. The source of this funding would be the HRA's Housing and Redevelopment Fund, uh, and the HRA is being asked to this loan tonight. Um, staff is also recommending um, on a separate piece that a uh, $100,000 forgivable loan be provided to Aon in 2018 um, for the rehabilitation of affordable housing units. Uh, that would be coming through the EDA and would really be a separate action by the EDA. Uh, with the $150,000 loan that's before the HRA, a couple of things. One is <coughs> that would, that would, um, give Aon the ability, um, there's a property tax classification called 4D uh, that is a reduced property tax on a piece of property if um, there are some requirements by a government entity that there be affordability um, on that piece of property. This $150,000 loan would give Aon the ability to seek that 4D classification um, and 
uh, a calculation was done on the impact of that. I believe it was uh, $39,000 would be the tax impact to the city in uh, 2018. I didn't bring that calculation with me. Um, I don't have that either. I 39,141.23. All right. Um, and so, you know, I think that that should be considered in the, in the broader picture. Um, so, you know, I think with that, um, we could just turn it over to questions you might have and I possibly address those. All right, are there any questions? If I may. Um, okay. A couple Commissioner questions, Elliott? And then could you state your name for the record, please? Hmm. Good evening, my name is Blake Hopkins with Aon. Good evening, Mr. Hopkins. Good evening. A um, couple questions. And first off, um, in terms of offering this financial assistance and everything, I have no problems with that. But the, when we just mentioned about the 20% uh, of the units affordable, 50% or below, mm -hmm. it's the first time I've seen anything. We've talked a lot about affordable housing. I have no idea yeah. how you're going to price those units. Yeah. And no idea. At, at what level, no idea what sort of criteria you're going to establish for the residents mm -hmm. coming in and if you're going to have floating floating rents. I, I have no idea how yeah. you're going to manage that complex. And and typically what we look at it for affordability is that's actually 60% AMI rents. Um, and so what we've been kind of proposing um, previously was 100% of the units would be at 60% or less. Actually. So uh, and the way that we typically do that is uh, review the uh, incomes of the uh, residents. Uh, typically, we do that at least when we, you know, accept their uh, proposal uh, to their application to become a tenant, um, and it's set basically on the county level. So it represents 60% of the area median income, and we would restrict rents and incomes at those levels. Kay. And that's what we consider affordable based on uh, typically our tax credit. At 60%, do you expect any displacements? Um, we are not. So typically, what we see with these as well is we like to see grant folks grandfathered in, um, so if people who are there today would remain, but as new tenants came in, they would be essentially screened and reviewed uh, to see if their incomes meet the affordability standard. Okay. Um, are you going to establish criteria for new tenants coming in? Um, in terms of screening when they... Correct. Yes, yeah, so the, we would have... Standard screening. Yeah, we would have standard screening, standard screening criteria that looks at uh, background checks in terms of uh, doing a criminal check. Um, we typically also look at um, income levels to make sure that they have at least, uh, I think it's two times uh, the rent level uh, that they can, they can put in. So there are certainly screening criteria that we put in place to make sure um, that we're, you know, making sure we're creating a, a safe environment for the residents uh, and making sure that everyone who does apply uh, meets that established criteria. Do you expect at 60%, if that's the, the mean, with 20% at 50% or less, that you're going to generate sufficient revenue to maintain a longstanding maintenance plot program yep. on not only the major projects, but the, the annual maintenance? Yep, and that's, that's part of sort of the balancing act, if you will. Um, and that's why you know, a lot of the public subsidy is important to help meet those standards, um, where it's finding that balance between uh, keeping the rents low and affordable but also making sure we make our, you know, required debt service coverage payments. Um, we will have a $22.4 million Fannie Mae loan that is going to have required payments. So uh, to the extent that we can keep those expenses lower through the 4D classification, um, the easier it is for us to keep the rents lower as well. Mr. Devich. Uh, thank you, Chair Supple. Yeah, the one question um, I had, or maybe you want to comment on it more, because I know that um, this has been brought up to me by, mm -hmm. by a number of people, and that is, um, w explain about uh, the uh, the criminal background that you do uh, mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that um, again to to make that complex as safe as it possibly can be. Yeah. Uh, making sure that uh, folks that have criminal backgrounds are not in that. In and that so complex. for each every every property is different depending on you know the funding sources we have. But for this particular property, what we're putting together is um, a criminal background check that looks at any felonies in the last five years. Um, would offer be a denial. Um, uh, drugs in the last 10 years, um, denial. Um, we would have um, three or more gross misdemeanors or felonies of any kind in the last 10 years, denial as well for those. So we'd have some uh, restrictions on the residents that become. 
All right, do we have other questions? Commissioner yes. Howard? Um, I'm just wondering if you, and I know that some of this will be repeat for us, but if you could sort of back up to the, um, and, and give us a little bit of the, the, the last several months from when you got into the apartments, what they look like, uh, the, the effort to kind of evaluate that, and then with these uh, types of resources, particular on uh, to uh, improve quality, you know, what are some of your plans? What, what do you envision? Yep. So we have gone through um, two separate um, property needs assessments through third parties. Uh, both our lender uh, through Fannie Mae required a third party assessment to come through and inspect the property. Um, and then our equity partner, who's putting in 90% of the cash equity, um, they required an inspection as well. So uh, what we found is probably one of the biggest issues is um, the grading out there um, has been causing a lot of flooding in some of the garden units um, and causing those units to actually be down. So there's a, a fair number of down units there. Um, a lot of the common areas need uh, cosmetic improvements, uh, carpeting, painting, uh, doorways need to be improved. And then inside the units themselves, um, we found the need for um, a lot of improvements in the, in the kitchen areas, um, as well as some uh, mildew and mold, primarily in the garden units. Um, so those are kind of the immediate needs that we're going to be addressing right after closing. Um, we have a longer term, uh, it's actually a 20 year property needs assessment plan, but uh, sort of the game plan is to come in, do some of those immediate needs right away, uh, and then over the next three to four years, uh, we have plans for the roof. Roofs are gonna need improvements. Uh, windows as well are some of the bigger items. Um, but really kind of getting some of those major health uh, issues cleaned up right away is our, our main priority. And are there plans uh, to seek other public resources from larger uh, entities? Yes, and yes. so we've, we've been in conversations with Hennepin County as well as Minnesota Housing. Uh, those are probably two of the larger uh, public sources that um, we've had discussions with about it. Uh, this development. We don't anticipate those funds being available prior to closing on September 7th, um, but certainly over the next year, um, those are conversations we're going to be uh, hopefully continuing and, and coming to some sort of resolution. Commissioner Rubenstein. I'm just making a statement, frankly, mm -hmm. on a ethical moral basis, uh, since I you, you are going with some standard uh, rules set by the county, et cetera, in regards to criminal background. Mm -hmm. um, my synagogue and Jewish community action throughout the Twin Cities has been working with Isaiah and other groups of faith uh, to address the issue of uh, rehabilitation of pe uh, people who have been formerly incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And probably the biggest uh, step uh, impediment to their re-entering society as uh, contributing citizens uh, is the fact that they're excluded from virtually all housing, except mm -hmm. for their, maybe their parents, if their parents own their own home. Uh, yeah. This is really a, uh, a stain on our society that people who have paid their dues, who have gone through their, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, probation, if that was part of their uh, sentence, et cetera, uh, are still excluded 10 years later uh, from finding stable housing. And uh, this is something that can't be addressed by the city of Richfield, I know that. Mm -hmm. But I hope that the state of Minnesota will at some point, sooner rather than later, relook uh, various aspects of our cr criminal justice system, in particular as uh, addressing the re-entry of people who want to be contributing members of society and the impediments placed in their way. And and I, d I do appreciate that, and, and it, the barriers to entry is something we, we've wrestled with as well. Um, we have heard from some residents that there is a concern for safety at the site, so that was one of our concerns too, is trying to find a balance between um, you know, ensuring safety, but then also being understanding your, your position as well. All right, do we have any other questions? I, I do. Commissioner Sandel. Um, and I know I was just reviewing the restrictive covenants for qualifying tenants and, and while this whole system is going on, from the commencement of the qualified period, project period, at least 20% of the rental units on the property will be occupied or are treated as occupied or held vacant and available for occupancy for qualifying tenants. 
and then it references whose income does not exceed 50% of the Minneapolis-St. Paul metropolitan statistical area median income for the applicable calendar year. Um, but then I heard you say that everyone is going to be 60% or less, 100% of the residents. We, uh, our goal is 100% to be 60% AMI or less. Okay. And so, so that, that's actually what the, I'm sorry, the, the 4D requirement requires 60% as opposed to 50%. Um, so in order to receive the 4D classification for all 422 units, all 422 units would need to be restricted at that 60% AMI level. Um, and what we typically would prefer to see happen is those units, who, who are there today are grandfathered in, and then uh, new residents are uh, reviewed as they apply, um, and that's how they're entered in. All right, did that answer your question? I guess I, um, I was under the impression that the city has kind of established a standard of 20% of low income and the rest affordable or more affordable um, or more market rate. And I guess this is all below market rate. Well, as it stands today, the rents are typically ranging between 50 and 54% AMI today. Okay. Um, so there'd still be a little bit of cushion as it stands right now. Um, and those rents, they increase by about 3% annually, uh, just with inflation. So there is a little bit of cushion now <coughs> between where the actual rents are today and what the 4D classification would require. So, so to paraphrase, Richfield has one standard and the county has another standard and you're trying mm -hmm. to meet both standards? For the 4D, we, our preference would be to meet the county, this, the 60%, 100% at 60% as opposed to the just 20% at 50%. Okay, but I understand that, yep. but we're also signing an agreement that's saying the 20%, so that's going to be in addition to the other people being at 60%? You're meeting both standards? Is that Mr. Stark? Well, I don't know if this I'm going to make things better or worse. Um, I, I don't like negotiating. Yeah. You know, from the <laughs> well, no, we're just trying to understand what we're signing. I, I, it's possible that the person that wrote some of these terms, uh, being me, was, um, was mistaken. Um, so I, I was thinking that the 20% per, at 50% was something that was a helping Aon accomplish their needs. If it makes the HRA feel more comfortable, um, to amend that to say 20% at 60%. Um, and if uh, Aon was amenable to that, staff would have no issue with that. Um, so that's one issue. The second issue um, that Commissioner Sandal brought up about kind of mixed income housing, that the policy is it has to be at least 20% affordable mm -hmm. uh, and presumably then the other 80% would be market rate. I would say that that has been a policy uh, but that policy has only been applied to new construction. We've never really applied that to um, existing okay. affordable housing. Uh, okay. So w in essence, we don't have a policy on existing affordable housing, and that's one of the things that we brought to uh, the HRA's attention at last month's work session, that we need to work more on that policy. Okay. All right, thoughts? Yeah. Commissioner Rubenstein? Well, I was, she, she already brought up my issue, so it's been addressed. All right, Commissioner Howard. I guess I'm, um, I would be fine with that uh, amendment. I mean, to me, the, the key thing, and to take us back to, uh, you know, several months ago when several hundred families, maybe a thousand people and 200 children were potentially facing displacement, uh, AN stepped up and with a proposal uh, here today still that is about uh, not displacing our residents. And n not only are they not dis being displaced, it's working on a plan to actually improve the quality of the of their living conditions of all the folks that are there. Um, so, with that being the goal, uh, to me, uh, if we make that amendment and when I hear kind of yeah, a, the a Aon's plans, it, it seems like we're achieving that goal and an important one. Uh, and I would echo what uh, Mr. Stark said about the need to continue to uh, discuss our affordable housing policy. You know, in some ways, when we're talking about these larger naturally occurring affordable housing uh, structures, it, it is uncharted territory uh, in, in some vein. But I think this situation, this solution is a victory for the community. And uh, that small amendment, I just wanted to call attention to you know what, what it's achieving here. Uh, and I think that's the most important point. Madam Chair. 
Commissioner Rubenstein. I have one uh, question for you. Um, as uh, a uh, tenant's income would rise, if God willing, they uh, rises appreciable, yep. appreciably, is there the possibility that they would be asked to leave because they exceed the limit? Our, for our understanding is that, fo that folks would be income qualified when they apply, and that would be our only time. Okay. It would not be an annual certification for all 422 units because that does become onerous on, on compliance and staff, but it would be as they apply, they would be you know, making sure that they're under that 60% AMI level, okay. and then if incomes increase from there, um, as far as I'm concerned, you know, understand, we would not be requalifying folks. Right. Commissioner Sandel. So, so did I understand you that it would be your preference that if we, if we leave it at 20% but raise that to 60%? Correct. And yeah. it may turn out that 100% are, are at that rate, but. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, th I think for the 4D classification, we mm -hmm. actually would need the 100%. Okay, but we don't have to put that in our agreement, or do we? I think you do. Um, I'm not a land use attorney, but I think, this, I think that shows all 100% of the units would be aff considered affordable. And so the 4D classification would then be applied to 100% of the units. The minimum is 20% of the units. So in order to even qualify for the 4D, you have to have 20% of your units be under 60% AMI. But then once it's at that level, it's prorated, essentially. So if 50% of your units are at 60, that's my understanding. Is that your understanding, John, as well? It is not. Uh, the, f the 4D program is something that I am not uh, familiar with, the, the 4D class yeah. rate. I would say that um, as of tonight, I wouldn't be comfortable recommending going um, yep. above the 20% at 60 or, or something in that neighborhood. I, to talk about um, numbers of you know 50% or more affordable, mm -hmm. uh, that's something I would want to explore more that I wouldn't be prepared to address tonight. Um, just, you know, yeah, since a lot of this, and, and I, forgive me, this did um, come together rather quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are a couple of things that you know are still kind of in process. One of the things that the loan uh, doesn't address that we talked about at our work session on affordable housing is um, we talked about if um, public money went into a property that there would be some requirement that they accept uh, at least a nominal uh, number of Section 8 vouchers. Uh, I talked about 2% of the units um, in a project like this. That would be 8 or 9 units. Um, so. I guess what I would ask you tonight, um, th I'm just springing this on Aon, is that maybe in your motion you could give staff the um, authority to negotiate on that one term, um, uh, including up to eight, uh, uh, let's say up to nine uh, units for Section 8 uh, voucher holders. Uh, yeah, minimum. Sorry. Yeah, and, and we, Aon is open to accepting Section 8 uh, for all of our properties, so that wouldn't be an issue. Commissioner Elliott. If I may, I, Commissioner Sandall spoke about the qualifying tenants on the occupancy restrictions. It, did you write that, John, the qualifying tenants? Because that calls for, for reassessing the, the income annually. Mm -hmm. And you just told me you don't only do it once. Yeah. And that, that disqualifies some of the qualifying tenants. So I'm, I'm, we're, we're getting, I'm getting mixed messages mm -hmm. on what you're telling me you're going to do and what the, the occupancy yeah. restrictions say. Uh, you know, I would say that I, um, HRA attorney Julie Eddington drafted the exact language. Uh, it was based on some input from me. Uh, I didn't give any specific direction okay, well about I wasn't whether it was being accusatory. I'm just, no, no, I know. I'm just saying what it says is yep. much different than what we're hearing from the podium. Yeah, and so it, it's possible Miss Eddington either made assumptions or that it's based on um, something she's done for other client cities. Um, so if it's not something... Uh, it's not something I asked her to do. Uh, it sounds like it's not something that Aon needs done. Um, you know, and I, I would say that um, to the extent you're comfortable, um, there have been approvals given that give um, the HRA attorney a little leeway in, um, in making f fine, uh, a, a executive director and uh, attorney, uh, a little leeway in making some adjustments to some of the finer points. So to clarify, it's yep. your intention to try and get the entire complex to be affordable at 60 percent correct you're open to having section eight people there correct 
and for the purposes of the county for the 4D, they're going to need you to do it at least for their initial when Correct. they apply for for um, residency. Correct. Yep. And that would be our preferred uh, route as well as you had mentioned. Um, if there was uh, openness from the commission to kind of hash out those items um, with the executive director and city attorney along with our attorney, I think that that'd be our preference as well. Okay, if I may. Uh, okay, Commissioner uh, Sandell. I'm certainly open to saying at least 20% at the 60% level AMI. Mm -hmm. And if they need to have it and, you know, then I guess this group w certainly wants the people that are there to be able to stay. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what, you know, you're saying the requirement is that all has to be 100% if you want to get 100% of that tax benefit. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I would let, st I'm comfortable letting staff take a look at that. But we obviously have language that needs to change. Yep. I mean, I'm just, I, and I know I've got all the confidence in the world of your accountants and everything, but with what we're talking about here and only qualifying once when they move in and everything else, um, and I think you indicated that to service the debt, you know, you you may be looking for additional assistance in the future, and I'm trying to find some balance for us as well as yep. for you, yeah. because I I'm, I'm relatively certain we you know whether it's next year or five years from now, I'm not sure how often you can come back to the well mm -hmm. and expect us to have money to make sure you can continue to service the debt and keep the maintenance up. Yeah, and, and I, that's my concern. Yeah, and I should I should have clarified. So the deal is underwritten essentially that we'll be able to make our debt service payments, um, and the deal will cash flow um, because we. We utilize, you know, Fannie Mae loans, which have very low interest rates. Our equity providers have well below market return rates, essentially, when what you would market rate develop, developer would see. Um, so the deal is essentially underwritten with those baked into it, which help. It does help in terms of the cash flow, and that allows us to have the lower rents that we charge. You know, that's why we can charge sixty percent rents, and that's and sort of our typical standard. Keep the maintenance reserves up. Excuse me. And keep the maintenance reserves yep, up. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we are underwriting three hundred eighty-five dollars a unit year into the reserves, um, and we fund an initial reserves of over, I think it's $400,000 right off the bat. Um, and then we, on top of that, we have immediate reserves we have to pay, which are another 400 plus thousand. So uh, Fannie Mae has underwritten this deal as well to us make all those assumptions. Um, and okay. prior to them approving the loan, they had to make sure that we would be able to pay it back as well. Do do they, do you know, do they come in and take a look and check your reserves annually? Do um, they do, them? yes, yeah, there, there, are, there are compliance requirements for them. And okay. so anything that they identified part of their inspection as well that said, you know, you have to do this in the first year, they'll have to make sure we do those improvements as well, so, yeah. Okay. Mr. Stark? So um, just a couple of points. One is I, I want to enumerate the kind of outstanding issues because I don't want it to seem like there's a lot of things floating around out there. I think it's three issues uh, that we're talking about perhaps changing this. It's changing the 20% at 50 to 20% at 60. Uh, it's saying um, uh, that they would accept up to nine uh, Section 8 vouchers. And it's uh, saying that the de determination of affordability um, levels, or I, I don't know the wording, but that would be at initial lease up only, not an annual thing. I believe those are the three kind of outstanding um, mm -hmm. items. Uh, and just for a point of reference, um, and I'm not saying this is a good example, it's just a example, with, uh, with the crossroads at Penn conversion to the concierge, prior to um, Soderberg apartment specialists purchasing that property, it was 100% um, affordable at around 55, 50 to 55% of the AMI um, afterwards, uh, they said it was uh, roughly 65 to 68 percent of the AMI. So that just gives you an idea. Um, you know, just the nature of apartment living, um, it's unusual um, to find AMIs higher than 80 percent. Um, you know, at, at some point in time, uh, somebody makes the decision to become a, a property owner instead of a renter, um, and that's largely tied to income. Um, and so, in Richfield, um, you know, the typical apartment is somewhere between 50 and 75% of the AMI is pretty typical, just as a frame of reference. Thank you. That's helpful to know. 
All right, do we have any other comments, questions, clarifications? Just, just one more, Chair. I, I just want to thank uh, all the commissioners and, and Ann for being here again today and the staff for working on this. Um, the, the slight changes make sense. I just want to reiterate, when you look at our, uh, the purpose of uh, the city uh, putting in what I think is a, a reasonable amount uh, for this, this loan, uh, when you look at the scope of the, uh, the apartment and the, and the folks that live there and the, the notion to not only preserve uh, a place to live for our residents, but also to improve the quality of that affordable housing. Uh, and t to me, that, that's the goal. That's why we have this item on the agenda. And these uh, details that definitely need to be worked out seem like the kind of details that help uh, you know, consolidate that and, and meet the, the desired intent of the HRA. All right, I have one more question. Go ahead. Um, uh, just reading the agreement, and again, it's the Declaration of Restrictive Covenants. Transfer restrictions on page three, number four. Um, the borrower, which is a Eon or Aon, agrees that they will, um, that if for some, that if I understand this correctly, that the, the project gets transferred to a new buyer, that the new buyer has to agree to undertake your, your, your duties. Yes, and Aon, we're long-term landholders. I mean, obviously things happen, but Aon has never sold a building. We have no intention of selling this building. Okay. Um, but my understanding is that these covenants would run property okay thank you all right sir chair one more Howard. i forgot one more comment i wanted to make um there, there was the talk of the 4d and the potential tax loss uh for the city i just wanted to make the point that uh if i'm understanding correctly with the improvements long term that would likely uh, increase the value of the facility and probably increase the tax that that's collected long term i'm talking is, is that correct yeah, I do believe that's correct. And on the 4D, based on the conversation tonight, I guess it's my opinion that the $39,000 tax hit that we were talking about was assuming that it got a 100% um, 4D recognition by the county. Uh, and that may not be the case if we are only requiring 20% of the units be affordable. So it may be a lesser impact. At, at what you're approving, I'm just not sure. And, and um, the only other comment I wanted to make, just on the because we're talking about city taxes and whatnot, just that the impact had over 200 or more of our children uh, left our school district would have been in the millions for the school district. And just wanted to make that point. That from what we saw with concierge, that would be correct. All right. Is would someone like to make a motion? I'll make the motion. All right, so Commissioner Howard has moved to approve a resolution approving a loan in the amount of $150,000 to Ann Seasons Park LLC, where 20% of the housing will be at 60% of the AMI. There will be at least nine units of Section 8 housing available, and the initial um, residency requirements will be done in when people first move into the apartment and not necessarily on an annual basis. All right, is there a second? I'll second that. It's been moved and second. Are there any further questions or discussion? I I'll, I'll go ahead. May I comment? And that is that we're, we're relying on um, Mr. Stark and the city attorney to review these provisions and um, make the necessary changes to reflect what the discussion entails. That's correct. And, you know, on some of these issues, there might be a, um, uh, some, a little bit of a wiggle, like on the uh, Section 8 units. Um, we'll have to work that out. We'll report back to you if it's not exactly how it, how it was described tonight. Um, but okay. we would like a little um, wiggle room on those three items. Any other questions? Is there wiggle room in your motion? <laughs> yeah, there's the word wiggle. Should we get the wiggle? <laughs> All right, and the seconder agrees to the wiggle as well? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, we've approved the resolution. And thank you for your time. All right. 
Item six is consideration of the approval of resolutions approving proposed property tax levy for the payable 2018 for certification to Hennepin County. Mr. Devich. Again, thank you, Chair Seppel and uh, members of the HRA. Um, this is our annual uh, presentation uh, to the HRA regarding the, um, the proposed uh, tax levy and uh, the HRA budget for the, uh, for the next uh, fiscal year. And uh, John has, uh, has some slides and is going to go through a presentation that I think pretty much um, in a very summary fashion covers um, you know, uh, what we're doing for a levy and what we hope to accomplish uh, through that levy for, uh, for a proposed uh, payable 2018. Okay, and if um, perhaps if the AV person, there you go, thank you. Uh, so I, again, this is, will be a pretty brief presentation, um, but we have as much time for questions as you have. I always talk a little bit about staffing though, because um, really that's how everything gets done. Uh, there are some major staffing changes for community development uh, as it relates to the HRA in 2017. Jackie Scott uh, did retire. Uh, she was here 28 years. Uh, was there any kind of a farewell for Jackie? There was, but Jackie was very, it was um, kicking and screaming that she agreed to have anything. Oh. Uh, she said she would have something if it only included um, members of the department and oh, at that. Bob. So I don't, Steve was able to come. There were no other um, non-community development uh, folks that were able to come. Darn. She was very. Uh, She's such a great lady. Yeah, she is. And we, we do hear from her. Um, uh, so she's a, a grandmother now, and uh, she spends a lot of time with her grandson. Uh, Assistant Director Karen Barton, after nine and a half years, took the position of Community Development Director in St. Louis Park. Uh, but we are uh, proud to announce that we have made some internal promotions uh, and uh, working on getting us uh, staffed like we'd like to be. With that, um, assist, uh, Melissa Paleman uh, has been named as the Assistant Director uh, with planning and some redevelopment responsibilities. Uh, and Julie Urban with us tonight uh, has been named the housing manager uh, who would also be doing some redevelopment responsibilities as it relates to housing projects. Uh, Melissa and Julie have a combined 30 years of service in the community development department and have served in many roles in the department. Uh, Julie, I think, probably has had four different um, jobs within the department. Uh, five, <laughs> the fifth, yeah. Um, so. Uh, she she uh, ran our planning and zoning for a time. She um, assisted in um, managing redevelopment projects, uh, and she has been managing our uh, housing projects as well. So we're, we're very glad for those changes. Um, additional staffing uh, and the percentage of their time covered by the HRA, there's uh, me. I, I charge 63% of my time uh, to the HRA. Uh, Kate Aitchison and the person that will be replacing uh, Julie um, as a housing specialist, 92.5% uh, of their time is uh, HRA. Accountant Mert Link, 77.5% uh, of her time. Uh, the administrative position, uh, administrative assistant position, which uh, was uh, filled by Jackie Scott, uh, that's vacant. We, um, we had kind of a short-term turnover there, uh, but that's, so that's vacant. And then Section 8, um, Lynette charges 70% of her time um, to the HRA. And um, Cindy and Muhammad in Section 8 charge 100% of the time. I would say that the Section 8 time, though, is covered by federal funding. Has that administrative assistant position been uh, announced? Is it open right now on the city's website or anything? No, we're hoping to open it later this week. There was, uh, so in, on May 1st, it was filled by a person named Melissa Hunter. Um, Melissa came from uh, a college background and she was contacted by a college oh. and uh, she was, uh, uh, she went off to Augsburg College uh, oh. and so it's I'm open again. Auggie, so that's very nice. But. Yeah, um, and so we hope to be advertising that later okay. um, this week or early next week. I know who would be a good person for yeah. that position, okay. Uh, so the uh, community development uh, HRA budget, the overall HRA budget, uh, for 2017 approved was 4.2 million. The revised number is 4 million, uh, and the proposed 2018 number is 3.1 million. Uh, the reason it's $950,000 less than 2017 is um, what we talked about at the work session is a great deal of it. 
moving kids at home and transformation home loans from the HRA to the EDA. Um, that's about 200,000 in project costs uh, and then the staffing costs that went along with them. Um, reallocation of salaries and benefits is a big piece of that. You know, as, as long-term employees are replaced by um, you know, more entry level or uh, the, the salary changes. Uh, we administered an NSP program that has now come to an end. Uh, we, we received federal funding for that that we recycled over and over until we finally used it all, um, and as well as grant reimbursements and expenditures for the Lindale Garden uh, site. Just the budget history that shows you from 2010 to uh, now, what that number has looked like. It's bounced around from six million uh, at a high in 2010 uh, to, at, like I said, uh, just over three million next year. Uh, so that's trended down over time. You'll see that we actually expend a, anywhere from 40 to 100% or 103% of our funding. That's very different than you'll see in the city budgets. In the city budgets, it's generally much closer to 100%. Um, the reason for that is so much of what the HRA does is speculative. You know, we have these um, redevelopment projects. We budget as if everything is going to happen all at once, uh, and that's never the case. Uh, so that's why you'll see our expenditures are actually, you know, generally speaking, 60 or 70 percent of what we actually budget. Um, some budget highlights. Most programs and projects change by less than 3 percent. Uh, there is a $70,000 in there for uh, Lakes at Lindale placemaking. Uh, that's the signage that um, will go in in the Lakes at Lindale area to direct people f to the sculpture garden, to Wood Lake, to other things. We're coordinating that with the reconstruction of 66th Street, so some of that will actually start happening sooner than later, um, but some will wait. The cost to administer the Section 8 program continued to increase at a faster pace than the federal funding increases. Um, we, a couple of years ago, we did have to subsidize Section 8 uh, to the tune of about $25,000. That was kind of a one-time hit thus far. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been able to cover it. I, it wouldn't surprise me if we weren't uh, going into the negative again in, that, in the future, uh, but if that happens, we will reconvene a work session to talk about it more. Um, as I said, Kids at Home and Transformation Homes, uh, we're uh, recommending that those be uh, shifted to the EDA. Um, but uh, that does free up some money. Um, in addition to money we already had, we have uh, $1,450,000 available for acquisition, demolition, or for assisting eligible redevelopment projects. Uh, we are uh, being a little cautious with that uh, money, however, for a number of reasons. One is um, it's, um, you know, we're, we're not in a hurry to spend it. It's not going anywhere. Um, what we don't spend this year, we'll have available in future years. Uh, secondly, there are some tax petitions out there um, from property owners th uh, that are in TIF districts that could impact um, the availability of this funding. So we want, want to keep a little bit of it in reserve until some of those petitions play out, which hopefully will be soon. Um, this is stuff you already know. I'm just going to skip this. This is about uh, shifting the EDA, uh, the uh, transformation home and kids at home. Um, new highlights. Uh, Hennepin County grant funds were received for Penn Avenue Facade Improvement Program. Uh, Karen Barton was going to get that uh, underway in, in uh, June or July. Uh, Karen Barton's gone, and so we're uh, scrambling a little bit. We're, we're hoping to get that up and running here uh, as soon as possible. Um, but that would be funds to help people make, uh, you know, do awnings, do signage improvements, do um, windows, uh, anything that is kind of curb appeal on Penn Avenue. Uh, funds were received for a Penn Avenue business directory. Um, with these first two items, um, it's still my hope that we would be able to uh, give a little bit of detail to these at PennFest. Mr. Um, Stark, yeah. while we're on the subject of Penn Avenue, I noticed one of the goals was to relocate the Penn Avenue liquor store. Can you tell us more about that? I'm going to wait until... Um, Executive Director Devich returns because he's much more um, involved in that than I am. Okay. And so we'll Thank touch you. back on that. Um, and then... May, excuse me, I ask a question? Go ahead. Is the business directory, are we talking about a booklet, a signage? What's the... I think it's undefined. Okay. Um, you know, I think in this day and age, um, it, it is more, I think, about information, um, not necessarily signage. 
uh, but whether it's online or a physically printed thing um, is yet to be determined. Okay. Um, and then every year, you know, we have our new home program um, and other programs where we either rehabilitate or build homes. Um, every few years, we try to do something out of the norm. A few years ago, we did a home specifically for um, people with accessibility issues. Um, we would like to do something similar to that uh, for an energy efficient demonstration house, just showing that um, what can be accomplished without spending a whole lot of extra money. And then here are a lot of numbers. Um, this just shows you what our funding sources are um, and what the expenditures are um, in, in accounting terms. Um, so these are our annual, um, under the funding sources, they are annual. Um, revenues uh, that doesn't really talk about our assets. And Chris, uh, I think, maybe could talk more about all these finer figures than I could, so I'm going to uh, move on. Just the levy history, um, you'll see here, um, as I said, 2000, actually 10 is off the chart, but that was the highest year at, um, but this is the levy. Uh, the levy has, um, we've maxed out every year for the past eight or nine years. Um, and we are proposing again that we max out in 2018. Um, the number I think is somewhere, that is very similar to the EDA number, somewhere in the neighborhood of 560,000, or 571. Um, so that is the presentation. Um, Chris is here to answer um, all the finer details about the numbers. Uh, while you were out, Steve, there was a question about, um, and maybe you heard that. Uh, yes, I, um, Madam Chair, members of the HRA, I, I uh, understand there was a question about what are we going to do with Penn Liquor Store. A and um, the Penn Liquor Store is um, is badly in need of, uh, of, of renovation. You know, uh, with the funds that we put into the, uh, the Lindale Store and then the Cedars Store, um, we are, um, we do everything on a pay-as-you-go basis. Uh, we're not, we're not in a position of wanting to borrow money, so to speak, uh, in the liquor fund. So the liquor fund has to make debt service payments. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And so, uh, the first, the first issue is, would we relocate the store or would we, uh, fix the store up that we have? Well, the actual cost of, of, of buying another spot and building a store from scratch is really out of the question. We don't have that kind of uh, funding available to us. Uh, and actually, I don't think we really need to do that. The store uh, location is not a bad location. The store that, what, uh, uh, that we have on Penn Avenue is, um, is a store that was built um, with not a lot of, to, to my way of thinking, with not a, a lot of excitement uh, to that store. They needed a presence on the west side of town, and they put that, they put that little store in. Um, we have looked at uh, doing a remodel of that store uh, using the same architect that uh, did the Lindell store and the Cedar store. And I'm, I'm pretty excited that some of the things that I've thought of um, over the past few years and looking at that store are some of the same things uh, and more that the architect came up with. That store could really, could really, really shine. And it could um, look like just a little smaller version of what we did at Cedar Avenue. And so our intention right now uh, is to be able to uh, get bids out on that store and, um, and hopefully have that store um, under construction and remodeling in the spring of 2018. And I have every confidence that what would happen in doing that is the same thing that happened with the other two stores that we just did. And I'm gonna, I'll be putting out some stuff in the next couple of weeks um, showing what we're doing uh, in business-wise, in the in our liquor operations, and um, and how we would do the funding to uh, to make that store happen. But I'm I'm very confident that the Penn store is going to take would take right back off like like Lindale and Cedar did. They're both doing just excellent, and I think we can do the same thing with Penn and really brighten up that corner. All right, thank you, Mr. Regis. Did you have anything else to add or? Um, I was just going to state that um, the, the, the levy is proposed as a 7.56% increase over the prior years, and it is the maximum levy allowed. And as you noticed in the, the graph that uh, John presented, that 
the levy has been increasing each year, and the levy is essentially a function of the, the city's taxable market value. So you can, when it dipped down, that was due to the market values decreasing due to the, the, the recession and things like that, and now the market values are starting to recover, so then the levies are increasing upwards and things like that. So it's been the, the policy of this board um, to levy the maximum amount, and that's what we, we've done for 2018. All right, are there any questions? Commissioner Sandal? Just a comment, because I was on the HRA when we agreed we shouldn't leave money on the table. Um, and I think that's really important because every so often something comes up where you know you want to have control of the site for future development and do we have the money or not. Mm -hmm. And if we have the money, we can, you know, take step forward and, and do it. So I'm supportive of keeping it at the maximum. Are there any, any other questions or comments? All right, hearing none, would someone like to move the recommendation? I will uh, move, <coughs> let me find the, save it. Uh, I would move to approve the resolutions that approve the appros proposed property tasks levy for payable 2018 for certification to Hennepin County. Second. All right, are there any questions or comments? Okay, so it's been moved and seconded to adopt the resolutions approving the 2018 proposed Housing and Redevelopment Authority budget and tax levy and the 2017 revised Housing and Redevelopment Authority budget. All in favor, please say aye. 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 I support it, but I don't think that's what she said. Oh. I'm going for the, I, I was yeah. reading the, at the top. Well, okay, of I'm sorry. Yeah. Which one would you prefer to? I believe that I would like to adopt resolutions approving the 2018 proposed Housing and Redevelopment Authority budget and tax levy and 2017 revised Housing and Redevelopment Authority budget. Thank you, Commissioner yeah. Sandal. All Mr. right, second, certainly. All right, let's try this again. So now that we've clarified that, all in favor of that, please say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, we've passed that recommendation. All right, next we have consideration of the ratification of an escrow agreement in which the Housing and Redevelopment Authority agree to pay $30,000 for remediation of environmental contaminants and $1,400 for the well sealing of a property sold to Interstate Development LLC by the HRA for the development of Plaza 66 commercial development. Uh, thank you, Chair Supple, members of the HRA. Um, this is really uh, a fairly straightforward and more of a housekeeping issue that we need to deal with uh, to be able to um, move forward with the, uh, with the uh, development with Interstate uh, Development LLC. And I'm going to ask John to make the presentation to the HRA on this. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioners. So the HRA sold um, a number of properties to Interstate Development um, that was based on a purchase agreement that was signed on July, or that was approved on July 17th. Um, after July 17th, but before their closing on August 1st, um, the interstate was made aware of environmental contaminants on the property. Uh, these contaminants stem from a former dry cleaner at 153766th Street East. Typically, in a commercial transaction, the buyer would request that the seller bear the cost of cleanup. Uh, in this case, Interstate is willing to pay half the cost and has asked the HRA to share in the cost. The agreement states that the HRA will hold thirty thousand in escrow to help pay for up to fifty thousand of the remediation costs. So the remediation costs um, could go up to sixty thousand, with the HRA paying half. Uh, anything over sixty thousand would be uh, all at the expense of of Interstate. Additionally, the agreement states that the HRA will pay uh, the cost of sealing a well found at sixty six zero eight Seventeenth Avenue. Uh, the HRA would hold 1400 in escrow to cover sealing the well. Uh, as I said, this did come up at the last minute before the closing on August 1st. Uh, so the agreement was um, signed and executed by the uh, executive director. However, no escrow funds may be used until the HRA approves the escrow agreement uh, or ratifies it, which you're being asked to do tonight. Thank you. Are there any questions? Commissioner Rubenstein? 
I understand that there was a major problem over in that area right today. Am I correct? Does that have any bearing on uh, any of this? No. no. Okay. I will move that we um, ratify the escrow agreement in which the HRA agrees to pay up to thirty thousand for remediation of environmental contaminants, and fourteen hundred for well sealing on property sold to Interstate Development LLC by the HRA for development of Plaza 66 commercial development. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, the motion passes. Next, we're moving on to HRA discussion items. Are there any items for discussion? We've um, already had so much discussion. <laughs> we've had a lot. Just one question. <laughs> you said earlier the market analysis is moving forward for Cedar Point, too. Um, I, it should be in any day now. We, okay. we haven't received it yet. Um, but we did, after the last HRA meeting, um, I did reach out to the consulting firm, um, and I shared what I thought were some of your concerns about the, the market analysis, and um, they did... Um, the people conducting that um, understood your concerns and are trying to make sure that the market analysis addresses those, um, one of which is kind of flexibility. Uh, we didn't want it to be too, um, too precise in identifying the market. Okay, thank you. Are there any other items for discussion? Okay, then we'll move on to the executive director's report. Uh, thank you, Chair Supple, members of the HRA. Uh, I really don't have a report. The only comment that I'm going to make is that when we talk about the uh, the HRA uh, tax levy, we talk about you know levying to levying to the maximum. Um, I, I think it's it, it's well to remember that the levy that we're looking at coming up for payable 18 is less money than we levied a dozen years ago, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. Um, in essence, we're barely we're barely getting to the point of catching up with the kind of funding that we had 12 years ago to do these programs. And so, for the past uh, for the past decade, we've been operating with a lot less funding for the HRA uh, than we thought we would have had if you were to follow kind of a normal pattern before uh, before the uh, recession and the housing value and, and just market value hit. So, uh, I, gosh, I wish it would continue like that um, so that we could have some gradual increases, then we could keep on doing and working the programs that we so uh, uh, really need here in Richfield. And I think, you know, it, uh, what we were able to do, if you look around, I think, with uh, all the housing and the redevelopment that we've, that we've been able to do um, has really made the city look sharp. Mm -hmm. All right. Commissioner Sandal? I, I will second that. I periodically hear from clients who um, – our new move-ins, and they like what's happening. They like the positive changes. They like the bicycle paths. They they can see changes that are the type of place that where they want to live. And uh, so I think it really speaks to the city's good efforts. So. All right, thank you. Any other follow-up? Okay, then we'll move on to claims and payroll. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there, are there any questions? I had one question. I noticed there was a lot of professional services provided by Less Worry. What type of services are those? So the HRA owns a lot of vacant lots. Less Worry mows our lots for us. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. That it's makes really sense. Just, just massages is that really what it is. <laughs> I just didn't know what it was. So. <laughs> All right. Are there any other questions? Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve claims and payroll. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, we've approved claims and payroll. Seeing no further business, we stand adjourned, and we will be going into session as the EDA shortly. Are we taking a break? Do we, do we need to switch anything over, or can we start right away? Just that you're the president now. Oh, okay, well. Yeah, you go from being the chair to the yeah. president. All right, so... We will call to order the Economic Development Authority meeting and please note the attendance.
and approval of the minutes of the regular EDA meeting from May 15th, 2017 is our first order of business. Uh, I so move to, for, to approve. Second. Um, the, uh, there's uh, down at the bottom, there's two different um, uh, PDFs. PDFs, and it's one of the PDFs has okay. goes with that. All right, so we had a motion to approve the minutes and it was seconded. Are there any questions, corrections, changes? All in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, we've approved the minutes. Okay, our one order of business tonight is consideration of the approval of resolutions approving proposed property tax levies for payable 2018 for certification to Hennepin County. Mr. Devich. Thank you, President Supple and members of the EDA. <laughs> uh, we did spend uh, a considerable amount of time talking about uh, <coughs> kind of a sketch uh, budget of what we were looking at for the EDA uh, in, the, in the study session this evening. Um, I know that we have, I think we have one slide to put up, John. Yeah, if the AV, there we go. There we are. And that's the exact same slide you saw in the work session. And so, uh, again, I, just, I think I'll just take a minute to, to just um, go over that. Because um, folks at home who might be watching this, of course, we're not at the study session. And so this is the first, this would be the first year that we have a levy uh, of the EDA. And um, it, it like, um, like the Housing Redevelopment Authority, it, there's a statute that says what that levy shall be, and it's based off of, um, it's based off of a, a, a value of, of a, a community. And so we're assuming that it would probably bring in something like uh, $550,000, $560,000. Uh, it actually has a very minimal impact on, uh, on an average property in Richfield. Um, and what would the programs be uh, that we would be funding out of it? And again, the numbers that uh, the folks might be looking at, these are uh, our proposed guesses of what we would be looking at. Uh, but uh, Transformation Home Loans, a very popular program here in the community, $131,000. Uh, funding the Kids at Home program, again, a very important program for Richfield at $130,150. A pilot apartment rehabilitation loan grant uh, program uh, targeted at $100,000. Pilot uh, business development assistance loan grant program, again, targeted at $100,000. It would take roughly $55,000 of personnel costs to run these programs, and that's included. And then there are professional services, memberships, marketing, et cetera, at a little over $4,000, and uh, some of that is some of the business programming that we, uh, that we contract out now. And then finally, uh, taking a guess, it says $37,090, but you know, it, that's our best guess of, of uh, what might be left over, assuming what the uh, levy comes in at. And the important concept there is that when you're starting something like, like the EDA, on your first year, uh, you, want to have, uh, you want to have some kind of a operating reserve to begin and uh, it, it may end up 37,000 or maybe 35 or something in that vicinity but it's important that we shoot for that so that we can begin and have that and uh, be in a good uh, spot to go off uh, and work in the successive years that we have the EDA. And I don't know, John, do you want to make any other comment to that or? No, I think you know, we covered quite a bit at the work session. Are there any questions? Comment. Comments? Thank you. Um, I just want to thank the staff for putting together such a, a comprehensive and forward-looking uh, model uh, for how this money could be used. And it's the challenge of both staff and the EDA to, in this coming year, to set some precedents as to how this money is going to be used in the future. And uh, so, It'll be exciting to be a part of that. Thank you for your work. All right. Commissioner Howard. I would echo every word that uh, Commissioner Rubenstein uh, said and would, would thank staff. And I also want to thank the mayor and our colleagues on the council uh, for their discussion and work on this issue to bring this uh, idea forward. Um, you know, uh, 
Commissioner Sandahl had mentioned kind of the conversation she's had with new Litchfield residents mm -hmm. and their excitement about the future. I really think that the creation of the EDA and the types of things we're investing in are really building on a momentum to reinvigorate Richfield. And I, I mentioned, I just want to just tick them off just because I think it's that comprehensive look at what makes Richfield such a great place that we're looking at investing in homeowners and helping homeowners reinvest in, in, their, in their homes. Uh, we're investing in our children and families and uh, creating stable housing uh, for kids. We're looking at supporting our local businesses and we're looking at improving the quality of our affordable housing. Uh, so I, I just think it's a very balanced approach in investing in the kinds of things that a city like Richfield should that's working and in a good place to build on uh, good momentum. So uh, bravo to, to staff for putting this budget together and for uh, everyone who's helped the genesis to this idea move forward. Okay. I will move that we adopt a resolution approving the 2018 proposed Economic Development Authority budget and tax levy. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Are, is there any, uh, are there any other questions, any other discussion? All right, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, we've adopted the resolution. Seeing no further business, we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you all.